Good evening and welcome to the Cape Elizabeth Town Council meeting, Monday, April 14th, 2014. Could we <clears throat> please have the roll call by the town clerk? Chairman Sullivan? Here. Council Jordan? Here. Council McCausland? Here. Council Ray? Here. Council Sherman? Here. Council Wagner? Council Walsh? Here. And the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any reports from any of our counselors? Anyone like to reporting a report or correspondence? Councilor Sherman? Uh, yes, the uh, Town Center Plan Committee had uh, its penultimate meeting, we hope. Uh, that's a good SAT word uh, today. Uh, we are nearing com completion of our report that we'll hopefully be sending to the Council next month after our meeting on May 19th. Thank you. Anyone else? No? I have uh, several items. Uh, in March, the Thomas Memorial Library Foundation Board of Directors has formally, vote, formally voted to conduct a capital campaign in support of the renovation of the library, and they will work to raise private funds to augment the renovated library as recommended by the Library Planning Committee. Also in March, the town was delighted to present Mr. George Baker with the Boston Post cane, which has been awarded to the oldest citizen in Cape Elizabeth since 1909. Mr. Baker is 101 years old, and we can all certainly hope to be in that good shape physically and mentally <laughs> at that age. <laughs> Last Thursday, the first meeting of the Senior Citizens Advisory Commission took place. This is an ad hoc committee that will explore how the town can better serve its growing senior population. They're off to a good start, and we will look forward to their findings in the coming year. Um, will the clerk uh, record Council Wagner's arrival? Thank you. Um, we're also pleased to announce that the Cape Elizabeth Recycling Committee has received one of Eco Maine's Excellence Awards that they've handed to 17 communities this year. So congratulations to our Recycling Committee for all their efforts and innovation. I'd like to note, it, note to the other counselors that the town manager has designed a new masthead for the agenda. So I don't know if you noticed that. But oh, yes. New Very colorful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, so, okay. And could we have the Finance Committee report from our finance chairman? Well, um, we, uh, first item is that Wednesday night we have a, um, Finance Committee workshop starting at 7 o'clock to have a presentation from the Cape Elizabeth School Board. And um, again, um, I've spent some time with uh, the chair of the school board, and uh, I think it should be a good, uh, a good session, and I look forward to um, a productive discussion. Uh, secondly, um, I'd like to um, announce uh, that we, the Moody's has... Uh, has awarded us a triple A bond rating, which is something to be extremely proud of. Um, this is uh, a tribute to the fiscal um, controls and uh, the uh, what I would call the fiduciary responsibilities of this board and with its town manager uh, that we would be awarded this level of uh, of a credit rating. It's um, it's something to be uh, very proud of and one that I can um, focus on our town manager and say that with, uh, with his guidance and direction and support, and uh, we've, uh, we've achieved a, a, a really uh, positive place as we look to the possibility of having to bond some monies in the future and being able to get uh, interest rates that are absolutely uh, uh, the lowest that we can we can receive as a community like this. So, very positive result and one that we should, um, yeah, especially those of us that have uh, that have been on the town council for a while. It um, it uh, is uh, focused on some of the work that we've done and the, the good the good efforts that have been employed by us as we keep our fiscal house in order. And I thank you thank you all for that. Thank you, Councilman Walsh. 
<clears throat> and now we have an opportunity for citizens to discuss items that are not, not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone wishing to speak on anything not on tonight's agenda? Seeing no one, we'll move on. Could we have the town manager's monthly report? Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Sullivan. did want to mention a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we a number of uh, notable citizens and people connected with Cape Elizabeth passed away in the last month and wanted to note, note them. Uh, first, Herb Strout. Herb uh, was, is the owner of the cellular tower hill up on Spurwink uh, Avenue, but he, he was very helpful to us over the years with allowing public safety, public works, and others. It's, uh, we, we just have uh, public safety up there now to utilize space on the different antenna on that tower. Very public spirited when the Alternative Energy Committee was meeting. We wanted to set up a weather station. He provided that and just a, you know, a good citizen who, uh, you know, was just very helpful in so many different ways. Uh, second, uh, D. Lee Rich, Mrs. Rich passed away. Uh, some of you may have seen the last couple of days, uh, actually within the last month. Uh, she was an active member of the Arts Commission, was a art show judge uh, for, for many, many years, and her husband, John Rich, also passed away, uh, who was a very noted citizen, the former Asia correspondent for NBC News, and uh, just a, a person that anyone knew who knew him, he was, he was delightful to know as well. And third, uh, someone who was very close to us, Bob Williams, Hap, also known as Hap, uh, he worked for 27 years at Public Works. He was one of our mechanics there. He was also a member for over 40 years of the Engine One Fire Company. He was the captain, the lead person there uh, for over 10 years. Uh, and, you know, just, uh, you know, a great person to know and uh, just a, a very dedicated person to the community. He was also, his full-time job before he started working here, he was a full-time fire fighter and for the city of South Portland. He's also the, the brother of Neil Williams, our chief of police. Uh, some of the, you all know Neil. So anyway, they're just, you know, three uh, very notable losses this, uh, this past month. I did want to mention that now that winter is over, uh, we're now going to construction season, uh, optimistically say. And uh, council may remember that Fort Williams Park is having some improvements. Uh, those are due to begin next week. Uh, the, the, by the, the road going up to the fire station, a little bit of drainage work, a few other issues there. On, by Chimney Rock Road on Shore Road, which is the Kirby section, uh, just this side of Delano Park, uh, there's going to be some drainage improvements going on. The council had authorized the part of the CIP this year. That's due to begin on April 28th. Uh, the Portland Water District is going to be improving a water main on Scott Dyer Road beginning in mid-May. That's between Dearborn and Farm Hill Road. They're also going to be doing another section on Spurwink between Wells Road and Deer Run Road uh, down by the Jordan property where there's been some water leaks recently. Uh, the state is going to be <coughs> paving Route 77 uh, between the Inn by the Sea and the Grange Hall. That's due to begin. Uh, the bids are due to be open this week and should be beginning in June. Uh, the town's going to be doing some other paving. Uh, some, I believe, on Spurwink, on uh, Trundy Road, a few other places. So everyone's going to be backed up a little bit uh, from time to time, but it'll all be good when it's done. Uh, then maybe we can enjoy the fall since uh, maybe you enjoyed the winter. I didn't. But anyway, we're, we're also having uh, household hazardous waste on May 10th from 9 to 1 at the uh, uh, at the recycling center, anyone has hazardous waste, it's a good thing to bring in. And we're having a uh, uh, pill collection, I call it, or drug collection uh, at the police station on April 26th, a medical drop-off, I guess we call it. And uh, that's, I believe, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. There'll be more information online, but uh, it's, a busy, it's a busy season. Uh, the cemetery will soon be opening for the season. We had a discussion about that. Uh, on Wednesday of this week, the, we'll be able to, everyone will be able to look at online maps on a website. Uh, that's gone going live for the first time. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's an awful lot uh, going on in the background. And I did want to just, uh, Jim Walsh mentioned the, the new, uh, the bond rating. That was from Standard & Poor's. Uh, he said Moody's, and I just, I didn't want Moody's to, to watch the tape of this meeting and think we were 
Well, take maybe they should take, take a credit, reading, uh, that's all. They should take a reading. They don't have to do the research, just follow Standard & Poor's. Well, good. There's two major rating agencies, Standard & Poor's and Moody's. And if you look at our website, I'm not going to go into it in detail, but we, we do very well with both. But it, I agree with Jim. It was very good to get that uh, ready, Standard & Poor's. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item is review of the draft minutes of March 10, 2014. <clears throat> is there a motion to approve the 2004, uh, March 10 minutes? So moved. Council Sherman. Seconded. Second. Uh, does anyone have any discussion or corrections? I have one. It's very minor. Page four. Uh, <clears throat> Lucas Homitz. This was a, during the uh, public hearing. Um, he has been to the club and, quote, has ever seen, I'm sure that should be, has never seen. Um, okay, thank you. Okay. Is there a motion to, uh, do we need another motion once we've made a correction as amended? I can't remember. I'll amend my motion to include that correction. Thank you. All <coughs> seconded? Second. Mr. Walsh, all those in favor? Uh, it's unanimous, thank you. Next item is a public hearing on the proposed ordinance amendment to ban smoking at Fort Williams Park. I'd like to ask Councillor Catherine Ray to introduce this before we start inviting citizens to speak as she's the chairman of the ordinance committee. So Councillor Ray, would you tell us a little bit about this? Sure. Um, the ordinance committee had a meeting on February 7th. Um, and at that meeting, we heard from uh, William Brunell, the chair of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. And they had had a meeting back in October um, and voted uh, 5 to 0 to recommend to the town council that smoking be prohibited at Fort Williams. Uh, and um, they put together a, a proposed um, um, amendment um, and, and some renumbering. So um, because we already have. Uh, you know, a, 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 an ordinance that this would just um, go into. But um, we also, on February 7th, we met with um, Mr. Brownell, we met with um, Bob Malley, the Director of Public Works, uh, Maureen O'Meara, the town planner, were, was there, and, Saint, and Neil Williams, the Chief of Police, so that we could all sort of have a little bit of a discussion about how that might um, work for the different, you know, folks. And um, so at that meeting, the Ordinance Committee and the other two members can correct me, but um, we voted three to zero to bring it back to the Town Council um, with the inclusion of smoking um, prohibited in the park. Thank you, Council Ray. Um, <clears throat> right before I open the public hearing, I'd, I'd like to remind everyone that there is a three minute limit per person and that we uh, please refrain from any comments uh, when someone is speaking and we should always, as always, behave with civility. So I now declare the public hearing open. Would anyone like to speak to this proposed amendment? Please, please come to the podium, which I should have mentioned, I'm sorry. <laughs> So please come to the podium, thank you, and if you would please give us your name and your address. Sure. Uh, my name is Jana Thompson. I am an employee at the Public Health Program at the Opportunity Alliance. Um, our address is 50 Lydia Lane in South Portland, Maine. Um, we are one of many Healthy Maine partnerships across the state of Maine. Um, we serve five towns surrounding Portland and also northern Cumberland County, the Lakes region. Um, I particularly work on tobacco prevention for the organization, um, and we really promote healthy communities through environmental and policy change. Um, so I really wanted to come today um, and speak about some other towns, um, particularly in this area, that have previously passed smoke-free and tobacco-free ordinances, um, particularly South Portland and Scarborough. Both passed an ordinance in 2011, um, and then you also have the town of or the city of Portland and Gorham had previously passed ordinances in 2009. Um, in total, there are 72 towns in Maine that have passed similar ordinances, and even the state of Maine holds a law since 2009 stating that all state park beaches and historic sites are tobacco-free. 
Um, and towns really do this for a number of reasons. Some of the biggest ones that we've talked about are environmental impact, really reducing the litter um, in these beautiful family-friendly destinations in Maine. Uh, there's also a big role modeling for children, having that positive role modeling when children aren't seeing their neighbors and, and parents smoking cigarettes. Um, secondhand smoke is also a concern for citizens. People that choose to not smoke have a right to be in these public spaces um, without having to breathe secondhand smoke. Um, and then a big question that usually comes up for towns is in, in terms of enforcement. Um, and I can say that, you know, from other towns that have spoken out after they pass these ordinances, they say it's easy to enforce. They really see no problems. People are always in compliance. And that's due to the self-enforcing signs that you put up that say this is a smoke-free area. People see that and they abide by that rule. Um, and I also just wanted to make a note. I think it's great that you're putting uh, that e-cigarettes were in the language to include um, it really is on the cutting edge right now. It's become a major problem um, and a lot of towns are now considering adding amendments to their current policies to include the e-cigarette language since it doesn't fall under typical tobacco and smoke-free um, definitions. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? My name is Scott Clark. I live at uh, Six Brentwood Road, Cape Elizabeth. Um, if this were a different type of meeting, I might say I'm Scott and I'm a smoker, uh, and I am. Uh, my question is not on the, the inclusion of no smoking zones to the uh, or, or no smoking to the uh, Fort Williams Park. Uh, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, I've smoked for a lot of years, but I'm. I'm a conscientious smoker. I don't smoke around other people, my family, my friends, et cetera, et cetera. But the e-cigarette thing I have a problem with. Uh, I've been using e-cigarettes now for um, about six months. I'm transitioning through e-cigarettes, and, and I just would like to understand what the logic of inclusion of e-cigarettes is here, what the basis for that is. Who do I ask? Well, we, we don't uh, participate in debate, but the counselors are listening, and I'm sure we'll be able to address that after the public hearing. Oh, so. okay. All right. Well, my comment would be is if it's, if it's an issue of the messaging around smoking, particularly for <coughs> children, let me give you an example. This is my standard method. This is show and tell. I apologize for that. My standard way of showing people that I'm not smoking or I'm not using an e-cigarette is this way. Tic Tac, electronic <laughs> cigarette inside. Now, this is what I use when I travel. I travel business quite a bit, so when I go through airports, this is what I use. My point to this is, is that no one can tell I can do it. Now, I'm not going to do it because I don't know if that would be legal in this building, but would this be considered? I guess that's a, all I can do is ask the question. So anyway, I think that, that uh, there's nothing wrong with messaging around ordinances like this, but I think the reality is, is that when you pass an ordinance that includes e-cigarettes, you're not taking into account the people like myself who are trying to quit smoking, and e-cigarettes are a good way to do that. There is absolutely no science that says that this cigarette has any secondary effect on another person. So if you do make the decision to include it, it's not based on science. It's based on political whatever. Okay. That's my Thank call. you. Anyone else? Uh, my name is Al Romano. I live at 4 Fernwood Lane. Could you Repeat your name again, please. Al Romano. Thank you. Um, I'm here because I heard this about the, on the news. I really don't have a, uh, a dog in this fight, but I thought I, it seemed odd. I was a little bit embarrassed, I think, for the town of Cape Elizabeth considering an ordinance for non-smoking in, um, in a public place where, um, under most circumstances, enforcement uh, by the town is going to be impractical. Self-enforcement. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the folks who, uh, who don't uh, take, pick up after the dog or the people who do litter are, are ignoring self-enforcement. But 
I would, I would like to uh, maybe offer a different alternative to uh, a ban that um, covers a whole year and that maybe the ban could be limited to public sanctioned events in the park where there's a greater density of, of, of population and it would be easier to actually enforce and do so vigorously. So I just would like the, the council to uh, take that into consideration as you go through your, your discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other comment? Okay. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Emily Bugby. I'm at 31 Cottage Farms Road in Cape Elizabeth. And I'm in favor of the ban. Uh, this is about health to me. I run in the park all the time. And while I respect the fact that people have become addicted to cigarettes, it, the more we can do to provide barriers and for people that are thinking about smoking or whatever, I think that that's important. And I, I think that the park is a, a place of, of health and wellness. And so anything we can do to promote that is something that I support. And I thank you for this opportunity and the consideration of the council. Thank you. Seeing no one else. Uh, oh, Mr. Brownell. Good evening. Uh, Bill Brownell. I am uh, the chair of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, and on behalf of the members of the Advisory Commission, I uh, respectfully request that uh, urge you to uh, to adopt this uh, our our recommendation. As you know, um, great things are happening at the fort. Uh, among other things, uh, the the arboretum, which has been developed now over the last two years, and will be continuing to grow. It was because of the, the, the work on the cliff walk site of the Arboretum that one of the members of the foundation came to the advisory commission and suggested that we pursue renewing the uh, proposal for a ban uh, for smoking. And he premised his, uh, con his concerns because of the litter the, the cigarette butts that uh, they were finding as they cleared along the, uh, the uh, cliff walk. Then again, last summer, once the greeting, the greeter program was in place, it came to our attention through two of the greeters that as uh, the passengers on the uh, scenic bus tours would get off the bus at the circle, one of the first things that they would do would be to light up and dispose their butts right there at the, at the, yeah, at the circle. So there is a litter consideration that I think you should really take seriously. And just as important, more important to, uh, is the issue with regards to secondhand smoke. In probably less than two years, development for the children's garden will be underway. It no doubt will be bringing many more visitors to the park, many more children. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to provide those kids and all the visitors to the park with a safe and healthy environment. I, uh, I just strongly urge you to, uh, to adopt our, our recommendation in, in what the Orange Committee has proposed. Thank you. Thank you. I'm seeing no one else. I will close the public hearing. <clears throat> Item number 52, consideration of proposed amendments to Chapter 12 of the Revised Code of Ordinances. I would like to, uh, at this time, ask uh, for a motion, and so, and and then we can proceed with discussion. We might even ask Mr. Brownell to uh, come back and answer some questions um, 
on that. So do I have a motion to consider to approve item number 52? Oops. <laughs> Councilor Ray. Is I, move that, yeah. I move that we approve um, consideration of the proposed amendment to Chapter 12 of the revised Code of Ordinances to include um, the prohibition of smoking in Fort Williams Park. Thank you. Is there a second? Council Walsh. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? I'd, I'd like to address the e-cigarette because we did have yes. quite a bit of discussion about that. And um, it wasn't about, and, and I, I want to say that it wasn't about being judgmental about of people who choose to smoke. The e-cigarette uh, piece came up when we were talking with um, um, Neil Williams, the chief of police, and talking about um, enforcement. And um, we had quite a bit of discussion about it um, be, for the same reasons that the gentleman was talking about, you know, people trying to quit and so forth. But when Neil was talking about enforcement, he said it's important to be able to enforce um, something that appears to be you know, appears to be smoking. So, in other words, um, as if if um, they're coming upon somebody who appears to be smoking a cigarette, they're not going to be going over saying, is that a real cigarette? Is that an e-cigarette? You know, what is that? So the discussion really was around um, what appears to be a, a smoking cigarette, whether it's um, an e-cigarette or um, a regular cigarette. So, and maybe the other um, two members of the ordinance committee might want to add something to that. But I, I did want to, because that was sort of an interesting conversation <coughs> about enforcement, so. Thank you. Uh, with it, Jessica, Council just Walsh. to reinforce that, there was quite a bit of discussion between Jamie and, and uh, Kathy Ray and myself, and we did kind of push back to try to get more of a definition around what an e-cigarette is or isn't, or what, it, what it, it seemed to be. And I know the chief had also reached out for to, to area communities that were having some difficulty with their smoking policies in public areas that the e-cigarette was not identified in those those ordinances or those policies and was becoming somewhat problematic. So I, I, I think it was treated um, uh, as, as, as a legitimate question and uh, there was, from our side anyway, a pushback to get more, more clarity around it before we incorporated it into what you have in front of you today. Now clearly the gentleman today had a Tic Tac, um, you know, container with an e-cigarette in it, which certainly you could argue from, from an enforcement standpoint, you could determine that was not a tobacco product, it was a Tic Tac versus otherwise. But the reality was that our, you know, listening to our professional, um, our chief of police, it was the right thing to do at this particular point to include it in this document and to make sure that we're consistent in the application of that policy in the park. So it was a good discussion. So, Thank you. Councilor Sherman. Uh, I was just wondering if there was a discussion at the ordinance committee level about enforcement. Uh, you know, is the idea that uh, uh, say a park ranger or a greeter or a police officer happens to see somebody smoking, do they immediately impose a fine of $250 or how would our police force or our enforcers typically apply the ordinance? You could ask uh, the town manager, I think, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, like most ordinances like this, we look for voluntary cooperation. You know, the, the only time we, we, we would ever actually summon someone for this, if they were belligerent, if there were repeated offenses, if when, when, when politely asked by a police officer uh, to refrain uh, and they continue to pursue, pursue doing it, then, you know, they might get uh, summons for the offense. But, but you know, the, the routine, you know, it, it'll be polite by, by our people, uh, by our folks who are there to politely point out the, the rule and uh, ask for cooperation. Thank you. Councilor Chairman. Yeah, that's the response I was expecting, and I think that to me, that makes this uh, ordinance very <clears throat> supportable on my end. I also just want to speak to the litter issue. I walk through the park almost every day during, during the warmer months, 
and it is astonishing how many cigarette butts litter the cliff walk as well as all of the benches that people have purchased for their loved ones. Those are a magnet for cigarette butts. I actually just walked to a friend's bench. If anybody wants to look inside this envelope, about 20 cigarette butts uh, littering the area around the bench. And you know, I don't think that the people smoking mean any disrespect uh, at all, but it's just sort of, uh, I, I think it's somewhat socially accepted that you, you're smoking and you just flick the butt. And, I, I, I hate to see that littering our park. Um, so I, I'm in full support of this uh, proposed ordinance. Thank you. Um, Council Wagner. Yeah, I, I was troubled a little bit about the inclusion of the e-cigarettes and mostly for the, the reason that the gentleman expressed. Um, and I know that we talked about it and whether or not it should be included because the science is kind of new on e-cigarettes. And the question to me is whether or not there's any secondhand smoke or in the situation with e-cigarettes is vapor uh, that would be damaging to the surrounding people. Because to me, this ordinance is about one litter and two secondhand smoke. So then the question is, so do e-cigarettes have secondhand smoke or vapor? And I've re researched it a little bit and the science is somewhat inconclusive still, but there is vapor and there's like some sort of polyglycol and there's some nicotine and there's potential carcinogens. So it was like enough to make me think, well, we should consider excluding e-cigarettes. I mean, I kind of hate to exclude something before you have a lot more data on it, but if, it, if we're talking about secondhand smoke and vapors and other type, and I think there was an example that we heard that someone sometimes said, oh, I'm smoking a clove cigarette, it's not a tobacco cigarette, you know. You can make these arguments, but if there are potential carcinogens coming off, in vapor that other people could be inhaling, I think it's reasonable. Um, so that's my spiel on e-cigarettes. On the actual wording of the ordinance, I, I think there needs to be a little bit of tweaking because right now it talks about lighting, inhaling, exhaling, burning, or carrying. I think that's great. Any cigar, cigarette, pipe, other tobacco product, or e-cigarette, or carrying or having in one's possession any lighted object giving off smoke from tobacco or any other substances that emit smoke then I, I would think that we want to cut off the that is customarily used and intended for inhalation into the lungs because I think, I don't know anybody that smokes a cigar that takes it into their lungs, that's something you put in your mouth. I mean, you might have some byproduct that gets into your lungs, but that's not the intent of cigar smoking. So you could, to make it more specific, just like if you're lighting it and inhaling, I don't think we need to get into the niceties of whether or not it goes into your lungs or not. So we should probably get rid of that last part of that. Um, the other question mark I had was whether or not we have currently, are you allowed to barbecue in the park? You know that, Mike? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. So that would be lighting something that gives off smoke. So maybe we put an exception for barbecuing in the park, to the extent permitted. Um, and the vendors, I suppose, some of them, what they do in there puts off smoke too. So maybe we carve some sort of wording in there that accepts barbecuing and the smoke emitted by vendors and their food operations. <clears throat> Is there any other discussion? I'm just, were those uh, issues raised at the ordinance committee level? I mean, did you guys have a d debate no. about that? Uh, no. Oh, it didn't okay. Work. So this is, okay. Okay. Yeah, I have a question, Jessica. Yeah. I have a question about process, okay? And, and this again, you know, again, in all due respect, Jamie, you've been part of the process. We get here tonight in front of the community and you raise issues about tweaking or changing what's in front of the community for consideration. I, I, just, I just don't understand the lack of understanding the process. If those exceptions and changes were things that you felt so strongly about prior to tonight, they weren't brought up by anybody in the audience, why aren't they embedded in the document that's in front of us tonight for consideration? It can be. You do an amendment. You do that regularly. Okay. okay. Process. Thank you, Council Walsh. Council uh, Jordan. I was just going to say I agree with Jamie in the wording that, I mean, I wasn't part of the process other than that I didn't attend the meetings, but I followed the wording and I got it and see it and there is issues <clears throat> and how it's drafted. So I, I noticed the other substances that emit smoke and immediately I went to, well, what if somebody's carrying around a stick that they're gonna light a, you know, a barbecue with? 
I thought of that. And so I agree. There's some issues with the wording. <clears throat> uh, can I just? Councilor Sherman, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, it, it's, you know, all these discussions are interesting. Um, and by the way, I'm not like texting. I, my iPad wouldn't, wouldn't connect, so I'm uh, looking at the ordinance uh, yeah. <laughs> very uh, carefully here. Uh, should have brought my reading glasses, but I, I'm assuming that the that is customarily used and intended for inhalation into the lungs sort of gets around the barbecue issue. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, but I don't smoke at all, so I, I mean, cigars aren't inhaled into one's lungs? No. Okay. Well, they are inhaled or they're stuck into your mouth, uh, so you probably aren't lighting using things that you would light a barbecue with and sticking them in your mouth. So, I mean, there, I, mean I, get, I get the point that Councillor Wagner raised, um, so I'm just wondering if there's an easy way to, to deal with this that, that wouldn't require us to list a bunch of exceptions, but instead would sort of get to the intent of the, mm -hmm. intended for inhalation. Maybe just get rid of into the lungs. Yeah. Intended for inhalation, period? Yeah. That, yeah. that seems like that, okay. I, I would like to add that I think that would, uh, preclude the necessity of dealing with barbecues. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so I that, think that's, that keeps it very that's fine. fair enough. Okay. So what, so could we have an, uh, an amendment? Uh, Councilor Ray. Okay, I will, um, I will um, restate my first um, proposal and, el and eliminate the words into the lungs. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. I have a procedural question. I have a question on section 4, 12, 4, 9, 10 penalty. Mm -hmm. If we amend the section that we're on right now, um, can, we, can we formally make that amendment to the proposal and then proceed on to the next section, or should we wait until we've completed the review of the entire proposal? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Just to, if I might, there's a motion on the floor mm -hmm. to adopt this. Uh, there's been a, a motion made by Councillor Ray to amend it. Yeah. It's yes. been seconded. Yes. What is now on the floor is that amendment. If someone wishes to offer another amendment after this one is voted upon, it, okay. any councillor may. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> is there any more discussion on the proposed amendment as it stands? Could I Councillor McCausen. Thank you. Could I ask Mr. Brownell to come back up or to answer some questions I have about um, what happens already in the park? Um, do we have receptacles for cigarette waste? Do we have, um, what do we have for signage? Sorry. Uh, what what Councilor McCausland is asking, do we have receptacles for cigarette butts, um, trash receptacles for cigarette waste? N no, we don't. Right. And there is no signage. Um, when the town council visited this six or seven years ago, one of the results of the decision of the town council at that time was that it was intended that signs would be put on the, in place at the fort, basically saying uh, thank you for not smoking. Uh, I uh, verified with uh, Bob Malley this morning that uh, those signs uh, have never been put up, and there are no receptacles. I'll, I'll just say for me personally, I don't smoke, and I'm not in favor of smoking, but I'm also not typically in favor of additional ordinances or additional uh, legal intervention on the part of the municipal authority into people's lives, and particularly in Fort Williams. Uh, and so it does strike me as really interesting that the council had addressed this, whatever it was, six years ago, and um, didn't follow through on its own proposed recommendations for signage. And do we have an opportunity then to do that now rather than implementing another ordinance? And I'd leave that up for a discussion with the whole council. I I'd like to ask Mr. Brownell about um, the history of trash receptacles at the fort. Um, I, I wonder if you could uh, mention that to us. If not, I will ask the town manager because this came up 
in my discussions today. So uh, there are, because there are no trash receptacles right. at the fort, right. and, and I understand there are reasons for that, and I wonder if you could illuminate us. And Mike would be in a better position to answer that than I would be. May, may, may I just comment one thing? Um, I don't like governmental overreach either. Um, I don't perceive this to be that. Uh, when we talk about the public health um, and the health to our citizenry, uh, I think the the government has a has a, a place at the table. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, Council Chairman. I mean, I, I I was not on the council when this came up the first time, but I do remember reading about it in the Cape Courier, and I thought the principal objection among the majority who decided not to proceed was an issue of enforcement, yeah, that there was. would be difficulty with enforcing. And although I can appreciate that, based on how I expect the town would enforce this, which is to have people go up politely to folks who are smoking who may not know of the rule and ask them not to, I think you're going to get 98% compliance, and you might just have those few strange circumstances where somebody may say, you know, well, I won't say what they might say, <laughs> uh, but uh, then you deal with those. But I think those are going to be few and, and far between. I think most people, when they see signs in a public park, they, they, they will tend to abide by them. And I, I do just see, as I said, I mean, it took me a couple minutes to gather all these butts. There are cigarette butts all over the park. And, uh, I, you know, we can move on to, you know, fast food containers next, but that's an issue for another day. Um, it, it really, to me, is uh, showing, and I don't think it's intentional, but showing disrespect for such a beautiful public place that I, I don't think it's imposing too much on folks to say you can't do it here. But Thank do we need to vote on the amendment? Mm -hmm. Well, after I've gone on. Yes, I think we should go ahead and vote on the amendment, um, and then perhaps I can ask the town manager about the history of the trash trash situation because that I think it's relevant to the discussion. So um, all those in favor of Council Ray's amendment. Can you reread that so I know what it is working? Sure, sure. Would you just read the wording again? The the amendment is to remove the three words at the end of well no it's not at the end but it's in the middle um, that says into the lungs. So just so I'm clear, so we're only voting on whether to change the language. We're not voting on accepting the whole ordinance. Right. right. That is correct. Thank right. you. Yeah. Okay. So again, all those in favor of Council Ray's amendment to remove the words into the lungs in section 1249. It's is it Council Walsh? All right. Opposed. Okay. Oh, so six in favor, one opposed. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask the town manager to address the um, history of trash re uh, receptacles at the fort. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Sullivan. Back, probably about 15, 20 years ago, I, I lose track, uh, the state parks uh, established a policy in Two Lights State Park, Crescent Beach State Park, and other parks, what, what, what was referred to as a carry-in, carry-out policy. If you brought trash in, if you brought materials in, you couldn't leave any of it, you'd take it back out. Uh, at the time, the town of Cape Elizabeth looked at it for Fort Williams Park and decided to do it. It was, it was basically for three reasons. Uh, one is that it was taking a lot of employee time to empty all the trash containers. Uh, secondly, the park was free and it, it, it had money. It cost money to, to take care of the trash. And the third issue was that when we had trash containers there, people would have lobster bakes and clam bakes at their house. And they didn't want to leave that stuff around their house, so instead they'd bring it to the trash containers at Fort Wayne Park. And you know what? As, as, as much as that thing stuck at the homes, the birds and gulls loved it. And then they scattered it all over the park. So uh, for that reason, you know, we had these old 55-gallon drums there. Uh, they get rid of them. And uh, that was the origin of that. Thank you. <laughs> I also chatted with the director of public works today who uh, couldn't be here tonight, but he said the same thing. He also said his concern about, I asked him about the possibility of specifically having cigarette receptacles, trash, just for cigarettes, the cans or canisters, whatever that you see here and there. He was very concerned that 
all kinds of things would end up in those. And, and again, he, he talked, spoke about the same things that uh, the town manager just did, and he just said it, it is just would be a tremendous problem. In those years when we had trash receptacles, they would open the park in the morning, and he said, I, you know, all the employees spent several hours just cleaning up trash, and so that you know, was the other reason they went to a carry-in, carry-out policy, so just so, yeah. Um, I have a question uh, on section four, I'm sorry, section 12, 4, 9, 10 on penalty. Um, I don't understand the last sentence of that section, and I wonder if uh, Councilor Ray could. You're talking uh, about the last section. Yeah, 12, it, it reads 14. the town shall also recover any fee that would have been assessed. Okay. Oh, I was going to say. If, okay. I, if I might. <laughs> this is a penalty clause that follows eight different paragraphs, one of which is the smoking paragraph. Some of those other things. Uh, do involve that particular line. This penalty line involves all of the different miscellaneous offenses in the ordinance, not just this one. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there any um, further discussion? Okay. So, <clears throat> do I have a motion to approve uh, item number 52, consideration of proposed amendments to chapter 12 of the revised code of ordinances as amended. I think I already Sorry, made yeah. that one. Pardon? I think I made that one already. That one's our, oh, that's right. I believe. Because we amended yes. it. Yeah, right. we have the full one. Okay, so are we ready to vote then? All right, all those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries. Item 53, consideration of proposed amendments to Chapter 19 of the Revised Code of Ordinances. Um, <clears throat> this is a report from the Planning Board. This item is the draft recommend, re recommended by the Planning Board. It is re recommended to refer this proposal to the Ordinance Committee. Uh, I wonder if uh, the town manager could tell us a little bit about this one. I will defer to the chairman of the planning board. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't see you up there, and thank you very much. For I snuck in as I once snuck out. <laughs> <laughs> I am Victoria Valent. I am the chair of the planning board. Yes. I am here tonight based on request from the town council to the planning board to review the definition of normal high water line in coastal waters. The Planning Board, after much review and citizen input, is recommending that the current definition be replaced with a new normal high water line definition that is based on a highest astronomical tide plus three feet. As the new recommend, uh, recommended definition includes the term highest astronomical tide, the Planning Board is also recommending that the definition of highest astro astronomical tide be added to the definition section of the zoning ordinance. And finally, finally, the uh, Planning Board is recommending within the purpose section of the Shoreland Performance Overlay District that the actual boundaries of the Shoreland District be determined from a field engineering determination. Uh, basically what that means is um, it's similar to the language and the meaning in section 19-6-9 of our Resource Protection District, which requires field determination of RP1 wetlands. The current definition of normal high water line in coastal waters is the apparent extreme limit of the effects of the tide, i.e. top of the bank, cliff, or beach above high tide. This interpretive definition is the basis of three pending lawsuits that include challenges to the former code enforcement officer's determination of the normal high water line. And the new code enforcement officer is recommending that the town have a definition that enables land use professionals to determine the line based on objective and scientifically sound criteria. The proposed definition of highest astronomical tide plus three feet is based on a hundred year study of storm tides and storm surges in Portland Harbor as well as a recent recommendation to the Maine Department of Environmental Protection to replace high tide with highest astronomical tide when defining the normal high water line. Adding three feet to the highest astronomical tide will provide substantial protection 
from most storms to address concerns with the apparent extreme limit of the effect of the tides during a storm. The proposed change to the normal high water line in coastal waters offers protection to vital natural resources within our shoreline zone. It can be accurately and consistently mapped. It benefits planning and regulatory efforts. The planning board is pleased to um, unanimous, unanimously recommend replacing the normal high water line definition with highest astronomical tide plus three feet. And I can answer any questions but this is the broad outline. And I believe you have a memo, a seven-page, eight-page memo from our town planner on this proposal. Thank you, Chairman Bowen. Are there any council questions for the Planning Board Chairman? Council Sherman. Well, I'm just wondering, uh, this will likely be referred to our ordinance committee. Uh, so I'm wondering if you would be kind enough to perhaps attend the first meeting when the ordinance committee does go over this, because I, I think they may have more questions as they dig deeper into it. I don't know if that's customary or not. I know you come to these meetings, but... I, yes, that is. I've gone to other meetings. It is customary. Okay. Um, we spent a year on this. Uh, we feel like we've been deputized, so our junior, we're junior deputies. There's seven of us now that can go out and answer any emergency questions about highest astronomical tide. Right. But we'll gladly be there. And I, I would also, I'm going to throw out a pitch that we did use the services of a senior marine geologist, Peter Slavinsky. He's from the Maine Geological Survey. Peter was amazing, got into the technical information that was a little bit beyond us, very <laughs> helpful when helping us get through the science based on this recommendation. I, I'd like to just commend the planning board because uh, they have spent a year on it, countless, countless hours, and there was a lot of, a lot of this is very technical, highly technical. And uh, so I, I think that the efforts of the planning board are to be highly commended because this, this, was, this is a very, obviously, significant um, uh, zoning piece for this town. So are there any, any questions for Councilor McCausland? Could I ask you a quick question? <clears throat> um, I read through the material, and yes, it is pretty um, highly technical. Interesting reading, though. Well written. Well done. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, I do have a question though about who's affected by this change in the definition and will it be um, affecting people um, in their homes today or does it only affect potential future development and are you anticipating any cost implications either to the town or to individual homeowners or future developers? Certainly. When we began looking at this, it was um, based upon um, our new code enforcement officer. He was new a year ago when we started this. And he was challenged with trying to work with the current definition. The current definition, as I mentioned, is part of three lawsuits because um, many people anticipate that the normal high water mark with the effects of the extreme waters was, could be um, the top of the bank, a cliff, or a beach above high tide. It, it was a definition that um, I could show you, and we looked at um, site plans in which the normal high lot water line would be defined, the top of the bank would be defined, and they were two different. And constantly we could see they weren't always the same. It was always changing. Mm -hmm. We really needed a definition that was consistent and based on more science than um, we felt that looking, trying to find that stain on the rocks, which was the highest mark. Um, we anticipate, based upon um, comments we got from the public, that when we first recommended just going with highest astronomical tide, which would have been around this staining area, that we weren't being um, as strict as uh, Cape Elizabeth normally is when we are dealing with shoreland wetland. And based on that feedback, we went back, and uh, that's when we invited Peter Slavinsky in, and we wanted to look at the extreme effects of the tide. That's when we got into looking at storm surge and astronomical tides and, and the effects of um, the crashing water from the storms, and it was one of these 
you know, show us a diagram of different numbers, trying to find that magic number that we always try to find when we're saying like 200 feet from something, 50 feet, 100 feet. And we looked at various scenarios. And it appeared um, that when we were in putting these scenarios in, that if you didn't have a rocky cliff, if it was more of a, a sort of like a that motion, that these areas were being inundated anyways and are already in our RP1 zone. And so we did not feel that we were making anything more restrictive when we looked at some of these inlets that were gentle and didn't have a sheer cliff. So those folks, we, we felt confident that we were not asking or imposing anything that an RP1 was not already in place imposing. Then we looked at the sheer cliffs. And the sheer cliffs um, didn't have as much, uh, when the tide gets very high, it's harder for it to get up over those cliffs. So we're looking at something that was in between a gentle, you know. And we also found in that scenario that the three feet we felt was enough to cover this extreme effects. And it was interesting because some of the public actually said it's not high enough. And so, but the board, we all discussed it and we came to a general conclusion that three feet will capture this extreme effects of the tide, which is part of our old definition and language. I start to understand the complexity in finding that magic number. Magic numbers, and, yes. And if I could just follow up on the, on the um, question of who's affected then, what you said was those people who were in the RP1 district already will not be um, further affected by this change. Are there others who are affected by the change? No, that was our greatest concern. We heard from actually the Farm Alliance. They asked us to look at a piece of property and we did and we asked, you know, would this affect this landowner? And um, we were then shown our P1 zone and we were shown in a diagram where the th plus three feet would go. And the RP1 was actually more restrictive based upon the diagrams that we were shown. And so we did not feel that we were asking anyone to um, have a, a greater burden because we were picking plus three. And as far as the sheer cliff, once again, we actually heard the argument from the public that we are not going far enough. But if we went further than plus three, then I think we were getting past the RP1 and we would have started. And, and I think we have made a, that happy medium as best as we could. Thank you. That's great. Councilor Ray? Um, I went to one of their planning board meetings on this and it was very educational and mind boggling. <laughs> I'm, I think it went to quarter of 11 and um, it's amazing the detail that's involved in this. So just, I mean, it'll take a while to get our hands around it and what they've done, but they have done an amazing job. Um, you know, and now it's coming to us, but um, it, was, it was unbelievable to sit there and listen to the discussions and the, the footage, and then when you take this, and what's the overlay on that, and how does this affect this a property, and so anyway, I, I just have to thank them for the work they've done, and we, we'll now have our, our hands full with <laughs> proceeding on. Larry, any Councilor Sherman? I, I think for me to understand this, and I'm not professing to do that now, it would be helpful to have examples, like you talked about, the, the property that doesn't have the high cliffs. How does this definition affect potential for a building to be built there versus the property that's on a cliff, et cetera? To have specific examples as part of the Ordinance Committee review um, would be helpful. Sorry, we were reacting to a bug up here. Hmm. So I don't know if you had those examples when you were doing this at the planning board level. Did you? Yes, we did. I didn't visuals. bring them because no, I'm didn't. hoping that we will delve into that level of detail. We, we did. We wanted to answer all those questions to find out, as you were indicating, who will be affected. Anything? Yes. Council Walsh. Do you need a motion? Yes. Yes. Could we have a motion to refer this 
draft <clears throat> to the ordinance committee. Um, and you'll have public Just, comment afterward. Just you want to have public comment now or after? Now? Okay. Um, I move that I move that we refer the proposed amendments to Chapter 19 of the revised Code of Ordinance to the Ordinance Committee. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Ray. So now we will uh, open this to any public comment if there is any on this proposed ordinance. Good evening, Chairman Sullivan and town council members. My name is uh, Maynard Murphy. I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. I'm going to be speaking to how the proposed change will affect our rocky coast, which much of our coastline is. After doing much homework on the subject, I believe that implementing this proposed change will absolutely allow increased pollution runoff into our ocean. How would that happen? By relaxing the standard by which we define the starting point of our shoreland zone, which this proposal does, we will be shifting the shoreland zone seaward, which will necessarily allow more development than what is currently allowed in our current shoreland zone. By moving away from top of the bank, cliff, or bluff, and going to Hass plus three feet, you would, in effect, be easing shoreland zone developing restrictions by, as I said, shifting the zone seaward. This means it will be more impervious surface built along the coastline, which means more pollution runoff into the ocean, more gasoline, oil, and chemical on fertilizers, etc. Uh, going into the ocean, adding to the growing problem of acidification, which is slowly but surely negatively affecting the shell growing ability of the shellfish which will in turn negatively impact the fishing industry off the coast of Maine. We have been to the planning board workshops and meetings, mailed in our concerns, and when allowed, have spoken a small portion of our concerns in a single three-minute time allowance. We urge them, and we urge you, to at least make a comparison to the proposed, to what we have now, and have had for more than three decades. In his presentation to the planning board, Peter Slavinsky offered to locate our current standard top of the bank and overlay it on the hat proposal to show the comparison of the two. But strangely, the offer was quickly refused. What better way to see the impact of the proposed change than to compare it to what you already have? This change is not required anyway. It's just a proposal that was offered for consideration. To that point, I offer an analogy. I have a few credit cards in my wallet, one of which is a favorite that I use on a regular basis. I get lots of offers in the mail for new cards. So let's say that I get a new offer that claims its card is better than any that I already have. It tells me to sign up today. Do I? No. I'm not getting another card unless I'm replacing one, but only if it is, in fact, better than what I already have. And the only way to know that is to read all the fine print and compare it to what I already have. Then, and only then, can I make an informed and intelligent decision. Just like in the credit card analogy, after making a careful comparison, I wish to stay with what I already have to better protect our environment and our property values, and reject the proposal to change to Has plus three. I urge you to do the same. Seek a comparison so that you can make a carefully and completely informed decision. This is not a credit card offer. Those are a dime a dozen. It's much Thank more you. important if than that. This is about our environment. Mr. Murphy, it's about our property conclude, values. If you could conclude, please. It's where we live. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make a comment? Hi there, George Foley, uh, 9 Pilot Point Road. Um, 
don't know if you remember Goodwin Hannaford, uh, taught shop here for many years. As an example of what ledge can do, Goodwin had his well located and he put in a new septic 400 plus feet away from that well. And yet still that septic polluted as well. He had to move again, move it again, the well again. It's when it gets to ledge, pollution and runoff has no place to be treated. So when we talk about the top of the bank, the whole point of that is to move development away from those ledgy surfaces. Sometimes the water only comes up maybe to the bottom of this podium, but if it's ledge all the way across there, if you spill something, it's going to run into the water. It's just the way it happens. Our current map pushes that back based on the top of the bank. It's not perfect, but we should at least compare that to what's being proposed. It's, it's important. Uh, and also the hat that, that they're talking about using doesn't account for future. It won't, that number won't be revised for quite a number of years, like 12 or 15 more years. We already see from global warning, warming that we're getting a sea level rise. And we have places now that are being covered by the foam and splash of the waves as they come in because it all builds on top of that. Hat plus, plus three sounds like it's going to cover that, but you get things like what happened down in New Jersey. If that happens here, it's going to be way, way worse. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Sheila Mayberry, 30 Trendy Road. I just want to uh, say that the planning board did do an incredible job in trying to figure out uh, what to do with the request from the code, enforce and code enforcement officer. Peter Slavinsky uh, added uh, the important information that it needed to try to figure out what to do. Um, what, what my concern is, there are two concerns, uh, and I think I've stated them in an email to you today, and I also forwarded you um, a, a map that, sh that shows the issues that the last few speakers have been talking about. One is uh, what happens at the uh, ledgy areas around uh, Cape Elizabeth when we use HAS plus three. The map that um, I forwarded to you uh, shows a small portion of Surside Avenue in our neighborhood uh, comparing where the Shoreline Zoning District boundary is now and where uh, it would end up with um, HAS plus three uh, indicating that there's a large uh, surface area of impervious surface that would now be open uh, uh, and outside of that shoreland zoning district. There are other places around Cape Elizabeth where that would happen as well. And uh, therefore, there is that potential for increase in runoff, pollution, uh, uh, that kind of thing that, that uh, were discussed earlier. That is, that is a, a, a big concern. It opens up a large area for potential development, larger houses um, can be built on those areas that are already within the Shoreland Zoning District. I urge that the Town Council look at those areas carefully. There does need to be a comparison um, with uh, what we have now on our Shoreland Zoning map, the official map, which is accurate by a certain degree based on what's in our ordinance and overlay that with what Peter Slavinsky suggested doing. I think that would be very helpful for your consideration on this issue. <clears throat> the, other, the other concern I have um, is, is the language being proposed for the uh, normal high water line itself. The, the, the planning board went back and forth on the language. Uh, and the, one of the proposals uh, to, to include um, language reflecting 
um, ledgy areas and cobblestone areas was actually taken out at the last meeting and um, and a, a, a short statement stating adjacent to tidal waters the normal high water line shall be the topographic line located at the astronomical high time plus three feet of the upland um, three feet upland I want you to please consider the language take, took out important descriptive um, wording that would include the extreme effects of the tide. And Cape Elizabeth has a history of uh, uh, being very protective of the environment and that language was taken out and I think it needs to be put back in. At least grandfathering language needs to be included to protect those areas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Your name and address, please. Yes, my name is Deborah Murphy, and I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. And um, it is a lot to get your arms around this. Um, I appreciate Molly's questions and the beginning of this because um, I did attend all of the workshops. I attended every meeting, um, uh, traveling through snowstorms from New Hampshire to get to planning board meetings because it's a really important issue to me and it's an environmental issue. Um, in part of the handouts that I gave you, I did a transparency. And underneath it is a Google Earth map. Um, and then underneath that is what the transparency came from. What the transparency came from was a copy of an enlarged portion of our, our official zoning map. So that's the paper version. The digital data off a digital file is on the Google Earth map, done by a file given to me by the mapper for the town. The black lines are the tax parcels. If you match up, if you look at the tax parcels from the official map and lay them over this digitized map, they match up perfectly. It's very accurate. I think what's happened is that with a determination of the district boundary, that the map hasn't been consulted so that if we have a district boundary, shoreline district boundary, that goes through the center of a road or next to a property boundary, according to our ordinance and according to the state statutes in Chapter 1000, that there shall it be. It is the center line of the road or it is the boundary of the property. On this one, what you can see and what I wanted to show you is there's a 75-foot setback in the shoreland zone that I'm sure most of you are aware of, and that's the most sensitive area where expansion is very limited and very restricted. In this picture, the green line shows the 75-foot setback on this property, um, and the, almost the entire house is within the 75-foot setback. The red line brings you out to the blue here, and brings you up to not even the lot boundary. So this house, this entire structure can be totally expanded. It will be totally removed from the 75-foot setback if this proposal happens. And that is because of our rocky coast, because we don't have straight vertical cliffs. If we did, and you took an elevation in the water and a horizontal measure to the cliff, then you'd be at the top of the bank or top of the cliff. But because you have a slope, this elevation stays the same, but it hits the earth sooner, hits it on the slope. 
Therefore, the starting point ends out way out here. So I really urge you, and the ordinance um, is very clear, and the top of something is the highest point. It's not the staining on the rocks. And there are as many situations where the top of the cliff was used, and I have seven surveys that are in the registry um, from properties in town that show exactly what Ms. Valant said, that there is a difference on them and the top of the bank by some reputable survey companies was located and was the ordinance was used to find that. So, and it is totally different than mean high water, normal high water. Those are marked on there. And oftentimes, just to add this, the top of the cliff is, if you look at a satellite map, if you have Google Earth and you look at it, it's the line of vegetation where the terrestrial vegetation stops and the cliff starts. So you that might be a suggestion. Um, and also there's an emergency bill in Augusta right now. It's, a, it's in the Senate. Thank you. It's if LD1602 you and it's a certification of our oceans. And the only thing we can do locally is Mrs. Stop Murphy, I, I really don't want to. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've reached our limit. Um, we have a 15-minute limit on public comment. Um, if the council wishes to expand that. Uh, we're, uh, we're just beginning this process. Yes. There are going to be so many opportunities for public feedback. I think that yeah. 15 minutes ought to suffice for tonight. That's Fine. my opinion. Yep. Thank you. And I, I concur. So let us now um, call our vote on um, item 53. Uh, consideration of proposed amendments to Chapter 19 of the Revised Code of Ordinances is recommended to refer this proposal to the Ordinance Committee. All those in favor? Opposed? All those unanimous. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, moving the on. The Ordinance Committee won't be doing anything more for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, uh, Chairman Volant. Thank you. Item number 54, segregation of space in the police station. I'd like to uh, ask the town manager to give us a little background on this item. Uh, yes, thank you. I think everyone's aware that we uh, have made some changes in the police department over the last 15 years since the police department was designed primarily, since the police station was designed, primarily the regionalization of dispatching and the regional crime lab, uh, both of which freed up some space. Uh, so what we'd like to do is to segregate off some space at the police station that's secure from the other space so that the, the police space is secure so we have people come in with domestic issues or whatever. There's, there's a clean separation of where you can keep people that are involved in those issues and, and the, the other parts of the police station. Uh, it's, you know, it's fairly routine practice at this point. We have I've worked with the facilities manager. We have an estimate to do a minimal uh, renovation and fit out that will take the, as you go into the police station, the old uh, dispatch space plus two small rooms in back of it and make that segregated space. The plan is that the Cape Elizabeth Historic Preservation Society would uh, utilize it during the library renovation project and it may stay thereafter, although that would still be determined. Uh, the cost again is 37500 I'm recommending that be allocated from the uh, unallocated fund balance. Okay, thank you. I made a mistake with the minutes the, uh, from the unallocated fund Unallocated, balance. okay. Yeah. Is there a motion uh, to uh, approve uh, the proposed segregation and uh, of space in the police station? Councilor Oslin? Can I just say so moved? Or no, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, is there a second? Councilor Sherman? Second. Okay, any discussion? Any questions for the town manager? Councilor Wagner? Yeah, <clears throat> do we have any design that we've true. seen the space? You know, I'm just a little reluctant to cut a check without seeing any design. That's what I was going to ask. You know, I've, I've seen it. It's, uh, I've gone through it with the building inspector, with, with Greg. And it's, it's basically what it is, it's, uh, I, I can describe it more. We're trying to keep things as minimally the same as, as possible. Uh, where, the, where the dispatch areas will probably cover up that glass, we might leave it there, not knowing the, the longer term use. 
Uh, that room stays exactly the same. There's, there's, a, there's a false floor there. We're going to keep that with the encouragement to put the heavier stuff on the other floors, and that would be a work area. Uh, there's, there's a hallway that extends sort of the back of the lobby area from one side of the building to the other side of the building. We're going to put a secure door in that hallway so that folks that are come into the historic society can't wander over to where the police departments are doing people and doing those types of issues for anyone else that's in there. Uh, there's also a hallway that after to the district that here you can't see from the front that goes to the back. Similarly, there's going to be a doorway there that protects this space from the other space. There's also going to there's also a card system that's been installed in the police department that's going to be modified a little bit so anyone moving any un, unlike now where the members of the historic preservation society can only go in the library when it's open the group could go into this space at any time 24 7. it would be available to them and everyone who goes in would be logged in as to who's going in by, by this card key system on the other side where uh, ed hunt is going the the department clerk and the other people who are there on, on weekdays that's going to be a dutch door uh, we went back and forth to the street. That's what they prefer. Uh, and it's going to be a, a normal set out of, of an office type area. And those are the, those are the only changes at this point. Oh, Councilor Jordan, I think, did you? Yes. No, I, yeah. I will openly admit that I am not a very strong auditorial learner, so I didn't follow most of that. And so I don't know if we can get copies of the plans so we can maybe optimize the renovations? Or what is the other thought beyond having the historical society in there? Are we taking into consideration what else could be put in there when we're taking into consideration doing the res reservations? I admittedly did not follow any of what you just described, so I apologize for that. I just can't p picture it while you're talking. So what are other plans? What is the thought going into the renovations you know, I, on, you know, if the council wishes to have a site walk, I'd be happy to give anyone a tour of that or have the facilities manager do it. Uh, you know, the, that is the, the plan. We're, we're segregating the space. For the short term, the plan is to put the Historic Preservation Society there. We need to do something with all the historic records and the library and renovations. But if you look at the notes of the meeting, uh, there's been no determination made, none being asked for at this point, as to long term the space. If, if the council wished it to be rented out for some purpose or, or whatever, that could be looked at. You know, the, the Historic Society, we've talked about them possibly going back to the Spurring School, but no decisions have been made on that. And we've been very clear in our meetings that we had with them uh, a couple of weeks ago on that. Uh, but, you know, so there, there's no, the plan is, is to segregate the space so it can be used by the Historic Society for one year. And then thereafter, you know, all options are open. But there's, there's one, one reason we're trying to do things really minimally is, is that we're trying to leave our options open for the future right. as to other purposes. But no matter what, we know that we would need to segregate that space in a way that uh, the police station is secure from the rest of it. That's, that's where the, the, the major expense is going with this. So the 37 and a half thousand dollars really does not much renovation just putting up barriers and segregating yeah. and, and actually the the estimate yeah that's right the estimate is approximately thirty one thousand dollars for the renovation and the other amount is assuming there might be some fit up expense for the historic society moving expense uh to get them over there and that that funds that as well for to have a professional mover uh actually take the records and store them and, and take the bookshelves down and put them back up, all those things. We don't have anyone else that, you know, it would, in public works we do it, we just take them, you know, way too long. And it's a lot easier to hire someone that professionally knows how to do stuff. And just one last question. So in your opinion, it's not worth our trying to figure out what to do with it and do all the renovations at once, just to do these renovations and then yeah. figure it out later? It's true that you're, I, I, don't, I don't believe that it's worth it to know fully what we're doing yet and to do all the renovations uh, because, you know, I'm not sure. The Historic Society might get there and love it and think it's the best thing. We, we have the, you know, we, there's been no decision made by the council on what the Spurring School is going to be, much larger issue. And th that way, I, you know, my, I think it's, it's uh, 
fiduciary, fiduciarily responsible to do the limited renovation at this point and do it in such a way that you, you really focusing on segregating the space and then spending as little as possible on tenant fit up. Any other questions or comments? Councilor Coughlin. I just have a comment. Mike and I met with the folks from the Historical Society last week. I think they were receptive to the idea. <clears throat> I think the space works very well in terms of being um, climate controlled for their purposes and what it is that they need to have archived in there. Um, I will say as a former facilities person, my sense is the numbers are pretty reasonable and I think that um, to answer your question, Caitlin, um, I think it's a reasonable and pretty pragmatic approach to move them in, spend a limited amount of money to put them in. My expectation is, and maybe I shouldn't say this on air, but I will anyway, that <clears throat> I think they'll like that space. I think it actually is a good space for them. Um, I think that leaves us with a challenge then of what to do with the Spurwink School, but we cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, we spend the 30 or 35,000 or 37, whatever it ends up being, um, to get the historical society folks moved into that space up and operating at the end of that period of time. If it has not been the right fit for them, we haven't sunk a lot of money into space in terms of making significant renovations or changes to that space. And I honestly don't believe that we're making renovations that will be that will need to be ripped out and redone unless we end up with something that's incredibly dramatically different and we say we're moving the whole police force out of there and we're doing something different with the whole building. I, I think we're, we're, again, taking a pretty pragmatic approach. Council Wagner, did you have Yeah, just a question about public access. So if we're going to be at least allowing the Historical Preservation Society there for the interim period, you know, what's the public's access to see these archive materials? It, it's the same as now. They, they, they're a volunteer group. Uh, they have Thursday mornings in the library. Uh, this would allow them to expand their time. The, 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 other, the only other, so, you know, the records are such, you know, they're, they're, there's, there's legal records, they're old historic records. You just can't have them open for anyone to wander in and out. Uh, you, you need to protect them, sure, and this would all be secure. The, the major difference between the, li the library space is that there's this beautiful display cabinet in the lobby of the police station uh, that the police station is going to, the police department's going to take all their stuff out of it. Uh, you know, there's, dr there's drug paraphernalia and other stuff there that I've always scratched my head about uh, <laughs> whether or not it ought to be there. And uh, instead, that's going to be turned over to the Historic Society for, uh, you know, just a beautiful display case for them. And, you know, and that display case is, you know, probably the, the size of, you know, about eight of those podiums. So it's, it's a lot of space. So it's really nice. And that'll be available for the public to see. And, you know, hopefully, yeah, I, I would hope the Historic Society will have open houses there. And, uh, you know, be, the other thing is a lot of people that want to go to the Historic Society tend to be older. They're looking into genealogy and other, other information. And the police station is a lot easier to get into than the corner basement of the library uh, now and lifts that people won't go on and all the other issues with the library that we have. So it's actually a much better space, in my view, for the Historic Society than for the people that want to access their, uh, their collections. Councilor Walsh. I just said, you know, Molly has more of a handle on this than any one of us here, but they, they looked at some temporary facilities uh, for different parts of the library while the library was under renovation. And this is a considerably lower number at 31 or whatever thousand dollars than some of the temporary facilities that we were talking about. In, you know, if you were to rent something for you know, 4,000 square feet or 3,000 square feet was going to cost us anywhere from 70 to $130,000 for the year, not to mention hooking it up to utilities and sewerage and everything else that goes with that. So um, it is a considerable number here. The other thing that's important to note in here is that this was disclosed as a $50,000 potential capital expense during our planning process. And the fact that it's less than that obviously is important for people to understand. It's not the first time we've seen this number. Just to my point. What is that? Councilor Jordan. 
Yeah. I just wanted to point out and clarify that Sorry. this segregation project was already planned and being thought of. It is not a direct result of the library because on the surface it might appear that we are yet spending another 30 plus thousand dollars on something that might have to do with the library that isn't even yet voted on. So I just want to make sure everybody's clear that it's not happening just because the library may be being renovated after it might pass a referendum in November. The segregation idea of the police station to reutilize space was already in the works. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Ray. Are you looking for a motion? We, already we have, we're on the table. We have it seconded and we had a discussion. <laughs> I know we're all a little. Um, any other questions or comments? Any other questions or comments? No? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 55, proposed policy for naming of non-school facilities. Um, this is actually uh, a 2014 town council goal. Uh, under the uh, direction of Councilor Ray, so I would ask her to introduce this item. Thank you. Um, back in 2007, uh, there was a policy for school buildings and grounds naming um, uh, policy, and that was put into place, and that covers a bunch of um, already existing things that you have a list, but uh, Lions Field, Hannaford Field, those types of things. Um, and what we are doing here is we are now um, broadening that to have a proposal for naming of non-school facilities. The um, manager has worked with us on putting that together, and it's here in front of you. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions, but if they don't, then I move that we accept the new policy for proposed naming of non-school facilities. Is there a second? Council McClellan? <laughs> Discussion? Questions? Council Walsh? Um, and again, this would be again from, for Molly and for Kathy Ray because you're both part of the building committee. Is this um, helpful in establishing some of the naming opportunities that you're pursuing? That's why it was originally assigned um, mm -hmm. so that it would sort of coincide with mm -hmm. um, the potential new library and so that we would have something in place um, for when and if um, we get to the point where folks want to give money to the library. Mm -hmm. And um, Molly might want to um, expand upon that because she's been doing some work with library locations. But um, I guess that's, that's down the road, but the point is, is we wanted to get this in place so that we weren't, you know, behind the eight ball if, in fact, the library um, does start to move forward and then people come to us and say, well, I'd like to give you money for this, that, or the other thing. We really needed something in place so that we knew how to address that and be consistent with, with folks that were, you know, coming forward, we hope. That's good. Good. Councilman Coslin? Yeah, I'll just, I, I agree with Kathy, and I think the um, council had this as a goal for the year, and obviously we had anticipated we might need this with the library project coming up and the potential fundraising project as well. But I think it's written broadly enough to be um, usable, and we're anticipating that it should be usable for anything that comes up in the future as well. So I don't want to limit it to thinking about the library project, but, but I did note in the language it does say specifically in such instances that this is being done in conjunction with a town council authorized fundraising effort. The town council's approval of the naming opportunity shall constitute the council's final approval of the actual name and the fundraising group may decline any contribution at its sole discretion, which I think is also important both in this case but also in any other opportunities that might come up in the future. Any other comments or questions? We're just looking forward to the new Jim Walsh uh, wing of the library. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've determined where the granite steps are going to be. It's going to be involving Coslin steps. Quality, the the quality, Dave quality. Sherman uh, Welcome Center. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.
<laughs> okay, all those uh, seeing no other questions or concerns, all those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Item 56, proposed revisions to fiscal year 2014 budget. I will ask the town manager to tell us about this item. Yeah, just, just very briefly, uh, I look, it is printed out on the, the agenda that I see online and uh, they hear this evening. Uh, our legal services line is being overexpended as a result of the monies that were spent on uh, the looking at the green belt issue, the update of the green belt. Uh, looking at the shooting range ordinance and some of the uh, the work that, that some of the issues that came out indirectly and directly and some of the issues you were discussing earlier tonight with uh, code enforcement. Uh, so anyway, looking for uh, an additional thirty-five thousand dollars to raise the, the amount for both legal and audit services to from fifty-seven thousand to ninety-two thousand. Uh, general assistance, which is what we pay to help out needy families. That's already been overspent by about $500 uh, when technically not allowed to overspend it, but there's also a state law that says we have to spend it. So <laughs> and, uh, looking for 11600 to revise the budget for human services from 50400 to 62000 And to pay for those two additions of uh, 46600 recommending that we reduce uh, the intergovernmental assessment line uh, from 101598 to 5498 So this proposal is expenditure neutral. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve item number 56, proposed revisions to fiscal year 2014 budget? Yes. Councilor Walsh. Uh, I move that we accept the proposed revisions to the fiscal year 2014 budget as described in our packet today. Is there a second? Councilor Sherman? I'll second. Any discussion or questions for the town manager? No? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 57, appointment of attorneys and auditors. Um, link to report, and, I, and notice here is also a link to report of legal and audit services, review working group. Um, this actually is part of the town council goal to review our professional services. And I, I know Councilors uh, Sherman and Wagner work on this, as Councilor Sherman is the senior of the two on the council <laughs> I'll give him the Sherman Welcome Center opportunity to tell us about the work that he and Council Wagner have done. Uh, sure, and uh, since I'm getting a little long in the tooth, if I forget anything, uh, Councilor Wagner can uh, uh, fill in the gaps. But it's actually in our town council charter, or the town charter, that the council appoints the town attorney as well as the town auditor. Uh, and so uh, the town manager summarized for both Jamie Wagner and me uh, the, the legal services providers uh, that we've had over the last several years, uh, looking at both uh, obviously who we're using, but the, the charges and what those particular attorneys did for us. And the consensus that, the, that Jamie and I reached during our meeting was that we would support that uh, the continuation of Tom Leahy as our designated town attorney, uh, but for some specific issues, we would uh, use uh, others. Uh, for example, Patricia Dunn of the firm of Jensen, Baird, Gardner, and Henry would provide additional legal counsel on employment issues. Uh, Deward Parkinson of the firm of Bergen and Parkinson and down in Kennebunk would provide services when Tom Leahy and his firm had a conflict. Uh, Bruce Cogshall would continue to serve as bond counsel. Uh, and Maurice Selinger, the third, would provide uh, legal assistance to us on affordable housing issues. Uh, and in the event a specific issue came up where there was a desire or a felt need to go with somebody else, uh, initially perhaps the town chair, council chair and the town manager may <laughs> solicit those services uh, that ultimately would have to come to the council for a vote to approve the retention of that attorney. So that's, I think, in a nutshell, mm -hmm. uh, what we decided and that's set forth in the materials as well. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve item number 57, appointment of attorneys and auditors? So moved. And I'll second. second. Any discussion or questions? For oh, you know what? I, I did neglect to mention the uh, accounting firm of oh, uh, Runyon, Kirsten, and Willette, so I would, well, 
Jamie made the motion, so perhaps we could include them in the. Yeah, amend, amended as, as stated. And I'll accept that. Thank you. Okay. okay. Any questions, comments? Well, thank you for doing this research. And uh, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 58, appointment to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, Councilor Jordan is chairman of the Appointments Committee, and so she can let us know what they were up to recently. Well, we had uh, someone resign from the Zoning Board of Appeals, so we were very pleased to have um, a few applicants apply for the position for an unexpired term extending till December 31st, 2015, and we are happy to appoint Aaron Mosier. Um, he is a recent graduate from law school, so he is um, happy to have some new material in his life other than studying books. <laughs> So pleased to have him join. Also, I'd like to take the opportunity to um, let the town know about some other vacancies that we have. Still looking for someone to fill the Personnel Appeals Board for a term that will expire December 31st, 2016. And then our next item on our agenda is to put two town councillors on the new <coughs> fire range committee. So we're also seeking applicants for the firing range committee for a member of the public at large, as well as a member of the public at large who is a certified firearms instructor. And the certified firearms instructor does not necessarily have to live in the town of Cape Elizabeth to serve on this committee. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Is there a motion? Would you like to make oh, a motion? I'd like to make a motion that the council approve um, uh, Aaron Mosier for the appointment to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And is there a second? Council Wagner? Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Item 59, appointments to the firing range committee. I'm going to go ahead and read this item. The town council will consider the appointment of two council members to serve in the firing range committee. The ordinance provides the committee membership will include two, town, two council members. The appointments committee, as, as Councilor Jordan mentioned, is now considering applicants to serve as public members. <coughs> two members of the town council to be appointed by the town council, one of whom shall serve as chair of the firing range committee. As you all know, I sent an email to the entire council requesting volunteers. And we had two, Councilor Jordan and Councilor Wagner. Um, so I would like to entertain a motion to accept Councilor Wagner and Councilor Jordan. Would anyone so move? Councilor Rakoslin. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Found. Is there any discussion? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Do we have to? Do do we have to decide which of the two will serve as chair? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I think well, that would happen at the committee meeting. <laughs> okay, they can, they can figure that out. <laughs> I, for the for the we'll public's for, <laughs> for the public's uh, edification, I guess I do would like to say something, and that is that although Council Wagner was recused from participating in council deliberations concerning the gun club and the proposed new ordinance. That ordinance has since been passed and enacted. So both counselors on the firing range committee will serve to uphold the new ordinance and facilitate its progress. Therefore, I see no conflict of interest. So all those in favor of counselors Wagner and Jordan being the council rep appointments to the firing range committee. It's unanimous. Okay. Item number 60, appointments of the election clerks. I'd just at, like to ask the town clerk to just brief, this, uh, brief us on this. Great, thank you very much. Uh, there are three things uh, as part of your item number 60 tonight. Um, the first one is that by state law, the town clerk uh, nominates the chairman of the Registration Appeals Board. Uh, that is a board that has never met, hopefully never will, but we have to uh, certainly be prepared if somebody um, wants to file um, 
something against the registrar, say we didn't put somebody on the list or didn't take them off and they wanted to uh, appeal a decision, it would go to the Registration Appeals Board. So that's what that board is. Currently, David Backer serves on that board, and I thank him very much for his four years of service. And um, since David is moving from the community, uh, Ann Swift Kayata has um, graciously um, said that she will accept the nomination as chairman of the Registration Appeals Board. Uh, and her term would be effective immediately. I'm sorry, it says May 10th there. Uh, but it would be um, effective April 14th for a four-year term until April 14th, um, 2018. Uh, also, I would like to um, continue uh, that Sharon Gower continue as warden, nominate Sharon, and uh, that Jacqueline Corey and myself uh, continue to serve as deputy wardens. And also, uh, there is a list of Democrat, Republican, and unenrolled voters uh, that we may use um, to fill positions as election clerks uh, as needed on elections, and those are for two-year terms. Uh, so I would uh, ask that you approve uh, recommendations as they are brought before you this evening. Um, <coughs> could I have a motion to approve uh, item number 60, appointments of election clerks, as well as uh, the nomination of Ann Swift Kayata to serve as chairman of the Registration Appeals Board and for the town clerk uh, to serve, uh, I'm sorry, for Sharon Gower to continue as warden and Jacqueline Coy and Deborah Lane to serve as deputy wardens. And I would ask that the motion uh, be stated to, to approve all these individuals on block. Council Law. So moved. <laughs> to include all of the nominations in block. <laughs> and is there a second? Second. Councilor Ray, any discussion? <laughs> Councilor Jordan? Uh, just a question maybe Deb can elaborate on. Having spoken with Mrs. Gower, um, I know she's often looking for people to be on the list as election clerks because it can get, um, they can be in need of people. Can you explain how one goes about becoming an election clerk? They would come to me if they're interested. We do have to have a balance, depending on the election, of a certain number from the, each political party, <coughs> major political parties. Um, sometimes we can have unenrolled voters, so depending on our need and, and who wants to work, I'm always uh, taking names of those that might be interested. So if they would just contact me, that would be great. Yeah, as I said, we can move from this list if needed. This is just a resource that we have, but we can certainly add to it as we go along. Anything else? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 61, approval of warrant for the June 10, 2014 school budget vote. Uh, Cumberland, County of Cumberland, uh, I'll ask the town manager to just introduce this. Yes, uh, I was expecting the clerk, but oh, you yeah. want to do it different? Yeah. Sure, that would be Good. fine. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is important uh, to residents here in Cape Elizabeth. This does call for the school budget validation referendum. Uh, we are calling for it on Tuesday, June 10th, which would coincide with the primary election, um, whereby the um, major political parties uh, will be holding their primaries. The Green Party, uh, Green Independent Party will also be holding theirs. As of right now, I don't know of uh, a state referendum vote. There's a little bit of time to decide on that, but as of right now, it would be the primary. So we would like to conduct the school budget validation referendum at the same time. The uh, question again would be yes or no, do you favor approving the Town of Cape Elizabeth school budget for the upcoming school year that was adopted at the latest school budget meeting of the Town Council? That language is by state law, so that, that is not uh, language um, that, that we came up with. And then a second one that this would be, if the Council still desires to have this on, the following is a non-binding expression of opinion for the consideration of the school board and Town Council. I find the school budget adopted at the May 12th 2014 Town Council School Budget meeting to be too high, acceptable, too low. Um, so again, that would be up to the Council tonight if you want to see that appear um, on the ballot again. Uh, the polls are open from 7 a.m. till 8 p.m. and again, we'll be at the high school gymnasium. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve item number 61, a warrant for June 10, 2014 school budget vote? Councilor Sherman? I move that we approve the warrant uh, as uh, outlined in our materials tonight. Thank you. Is there a second? Council Wagner? 
Any discussion? Council Wall. Just a clarification. Um, is um, a vote like this is uh, will we on a three-year horizon, two year? Is it a per all always we will always go to vote? Every three years. We voted last year, I think it was, so we're we got a couple more years, but you're right. So, Every three years, the citizens vote to whether they want to continue so this, the okay. referendum vote. So this is the second of a three-year window. Yep. Okay, great. Just for clarification purposes. Okay. Anything else? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 62, amendment to the personnel code. This time I'll open the town manager to tell us about this amendment. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> The personnel code uh, governs uh, all of the rules and regulations for non-union employees and for union employees when it's not specifically addressed in their contract. Uh, we, we have a, a wellness provision or a fitness provision in both the police contract and, and the uh, public work contract provides for uh, 270 per year to, re to reimburse an employee for the wellness benefit for fitness class, health club, membership smoking secession program or weight loss program or any other modified program leading to better fitness and health. It's proposed that we standardize the contribution to $270 for everyone uh, and that we clarify that this is only for employees who work a regular schedule of at least 20 hours per week. Uh, I have made the police and public works union aware of this proposed change and we've also discussed it at three separate meetings with the personnel advisory committee which is made up of representatives of all the departments, both union and non-union. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion <coughs> to uh, approve item number 62, amendment to the personnel code? So moved. Second. Council McCaughlin. Any discussion? How many people avail themselves of this uh, benefit? It, it varies, but it's 10 or 11. Out of how many employees? Uh, the eligible group would be 55, 57, including the part timers. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Council Wagner? Oh, did the, does the union have any opposition to this? They, they did not, because they already have the provision for uh, the 270 per week, and they all work at least 20 hours a week. Right. Anyway. Per year. Per year. Two per year. Per year. What did I say? It's per week. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Please didn't say per day. <laughs> Any other Sorry. discussion or comments on item 62? Oh. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Uh, I see no citizens left in the, the chambers for items not on the agenda discussion. So, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. They, uh, uh, Council Chairman, thank you. Second. Council Ray, all those in favor. Okay. Who had trouble?